Time to get into the, the discussion on the NDAA. This is the National Defense Authorization Act. It's the Pentagon funding bill. It's not every last dime that, you know, goes to the military and everything like that throughout the year, but it's most of it. Uh, Dave DeCamp has a great breakdown of it at um, antiwar.com. Biden signed it, and so now it's officially law. On Monday, President Biden signed the massive 777 billion Point seven billion dollar 2022 National Defense Authorization Act into law. The bill authorizes $740.3 billion for the Pentagon, $27.8 billion for the Department of Energy's nuclear weapons program, and $9.9 billion for defense-related activities outside NDAA jurisdiction. Media outlets are reporting the NDAA as a $768 billion bill, ignoring the additional $9.9 $9 billion. Biden initially requested $753 billion for the NDAA, but Congress decided to add another $25 billion to push the increase of the the push to increase the NDAA was led by hawkish Republicans who argued that more military spending was needed to confront China. With China being the Pentagon's main focus, a good portion of the spending bill will go towards research, development, testing, and evolution for new weapons technology known as RDT and E. The NDAA authorizes over $117 billion for research, development, and technology evolution which will be used to develop hypersonic weapons, artificial intelligence, space and cyber capabilities, and other advanced weapons. The NDAA includes $7.1 billion for the Pacific Defense Initiative, another China-related measure. U.S. military leaders requested the Pacific Defense Initiative to build up forces in the Asia-Pacific to further encircle China. Part of the plan included establishing a network of long grain missiles near China's coast. The NDAA passage comes amid heightened tensions between the U.S. and Russia around Ukraine, and the spending bill includes $300 million in military aid for Kiev. An earlier bill... Uh, uh, an earlier version of this bill included an amendment from Ro Kahana that would have required the U.S. to end support for the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen, but was stripped in the compromised version. An amendment requiring women to register for the draft was also removed from the NDAA. So that was Dave's write-up. I got a few more just you know little details from the bill. It's a I think 2000 plus page again, you know, we're talking about about $800 billion in spending here. So to try to break down and keep up with all of it would take far more uh, than about the 20 minutes or so I'm going to spend on this on the show. But some other highlights are there's a statement of support for uh, Taiwan within this bill. And so it's, you know, money directly for Ukraine, but Taiwan is also getting a, a statement of support. Uh, a couple of things that were dropped from this bill from earlier versions uh, were a sanctions, a requirement for Biden to sanction Russia over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And there was a removal um, that would have put a ban on buying Russian government debt. And then it also included a ban that prevents the Pentagon or the Department of Defense from buying any products that come from what they're calling forced labor in uh, Xinjiang, China. And largely, I think that's just a propaganda move for, you know, more U.S. government employees and to enshrine more in U.S. law that China is committing uh, human rights violation, uh, depending on, you know, who's how far they're willing to go, either committing genocide, doing forced labor, slave labor, uh, concentration camps in Xinjiang, China uh, against the Uyghurs. I think all of these are overstated, not that China doesn't carry out human rights violations against the Uyghurs, but that's a genocide concentration camp or any of that is a, a far overstatement. And I think even the for forced labor uh, is a major overstatement of what's happening in that region. 
uh, in the bill, Boeing is uh, getting to sell some planes. They're going to have uh, 15 or 17, excuse me, uh, F-15, and that is the S or E S variant that that they're going to be selling. And then the and the Pentagon had actually only wanted 12 of those, and they're also going to sell. F-18 EF Super Hornets, and uh, the the bill calls for 12 of those, and the, the Pentagon actually requested zero. And so this is Congress going beyond what the Pentagon actually wants to force more planes on them. The Air Force was looking at retiring a lot of planes, including the A-10 Warthog, uh, but the NDAA prevents the Air Force from retiring any Warthogs and requires them to stay in in. Uh, flight. Now, I believe I had talked about this a little bit because uh, in relation to this, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall, the delusional rabid dog nut job, said, if it doesn't for, uh, threaten China, why are we doing it? And because this plane provides close air support, he doesn't you know, really see it having a need in the, the U.S. arsenal. I'm, I guess, for retiring all planes, so I'm not really going to argue that we should keep the A-10 around. But I, I do think that there are some military experts who have made some pretty solid arguments for if the U.S. military is going to do what it's going to do, the A-10 is actually a pretty good and pretty reasonably priced option for that. Uh, but, but those... Uh, those planes won't be able to uh, to be retired, so uh, they they will stay in service along with like the other planes that don't really work well, like uh, the F thirty five. There is more funding in the bill for F thirty five maintenance. However, there are some provisions in the bill that you know major asterisk on this. If seven years down the road the F thirty five still isn't working and Congress really wants to, they could use these provisions to restrict the number of F-35s that will in total be purchased by the Pentagon. And so it's because the Pentagon, or excuse me, Lockheed Martin that makes the F-35 is so over cost and price on the thing. They're saying that if they don't hit certain affordability targets, then it's going to create a situation where they're not going to buy as many of the planes. But I mean, my guess is that if the time actually came for the restrictions to be made, the Pentagon and Congress would say, oh, my God, we can't do this for national security reasons. Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, whatever they'll have to, you know, whatever the crisis of the day is, they'll come up with it. They'll push it and then they'll buy more F-35s than they had even intended to in the first place, uh, because that's usually how these things end up working. Uh, there's more money, uh, in just other Air Force planes. Uh, there's money for refurbishing EAJ stars and money for the EC 37B Compass Call program and the T 7A Red Hawk uh, program, as well as a more, I guess, vague the Air Force Next Generation Air Dominance Program, uh, which I'm guessing just is money thrown at anything and probably a part of the, the $100 billion for research and development. Um, it also includes four Reaper drones and one Gray Eagle. I think those are both like the same uh, platforms and just in, you know, different uh, variants for different branches. Um, the eight... It, but it will allow uh, the uh, Air Force to apparently retire the, the NDAA, uh, some KC-130 uh, tanker or KC-10 extended tankers uh, coming up and then some KC-135 strato tankers. So some planes getting retired, but largely, you know, just more spending, more waste. Speaking of the F-35s, I just want to mention that a huge problem with them is apparently the green glow, and this makes it really hard to fly the planes at night and it's more to do with the headset than anything else. And so some branches are figuring this out. I think the Navy and the Marines have made some progress on fixing it, but not the Air Force. It's absolutely unbelievable that if one branch doesn't have uh, the problem fits at all, wouldn't have it very quickly, including the Air Force, which I believe has the largest fleet of F-35s. Unexpectedly. So the bill has some reforms on uh, sexual harassment in the military, but uh, 
Kirsten Gillibrand, who's really been pushing this, uh, put out a statement alongside, by the way, Chuck Grassley and Joni Erst, who are, you know, pretty solid, you know, red Republicans and everything like that, uh, criticizing, saying that essentially the overhaul and the, what they stripped out of the reforms that she wanted essentially kneecapped any of the actual reforms on how this is going to, to be overhauled. And very disappointed about that. Central assault is the major problem in the military and that they're unwilling to address it to this extent is really, really disappointing. The NDAA will require the Pentagon to brief Congress over the, our allies' reaction to potentially changing the U.S. Uh, nuclear policy and adopting a no-first-use stance. I'm not sure how this is ultimately going to play out. I understand that this was pushed to be in the bill by HOTS, who are hoping the Pentagon will come in and tell Congress that you cannot let the president adopt a no first use nuclear policy. I think it's going to maybe be revealing if any of this becomes public. I mean, you could have something like Israel saying, well, if the America adopts a no first use policy, then the U.S. can never nuke Iran because Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons or, you know, something along those lines. Lines, um, that, that could actually, I guess, be more revealing to the war state. But at the same time, my guess is they're going to try to weaponize this to prevent America from adopting a no first use policy, which basically says that we would never launch nuclear weapons first. And, you know, if the entire world adopts, well, not entire, but, you know, if the, the world's nuclear policy, uh, powers adopt and really stick towards a no you know, nuclear first use policy, that could be a really significant step in uh, making sure nuclear weapons are never used and we could celebrate New Year's uh, in 2023, uh, you know, make, make it through another trip around the sun without a nuclear holocaust here. The NDAA prevents Joe Biden from using funds to uh, to close the Guantanamo Bay uh, facility. At the same time, they're actually upgrading the Gitmo facilities. There's a good article on this right now at antiwar.com, uh, maybe in the blog section, I think, by uh, Brett Wilkins detailing the, the new uh, court facilities they're building there. Uh, but very unfortunate that we're not yet going to close uh, th this torture prison and and try to you know rectify uh the the bush torture program preferably by throwing george bush and dick cheney in jail and then last story on the ndaa it includes 50 million in funding for the uss connecticut but my understanding is that this is only initial funding uh for repairs on the uss connecticut and the 50 million dollar initial number signals that the the final number is going to be absolutely massive of course this is the nuclear powered submarine that ran aground somewhere or ran into something in the south china sea and a lot of questions on what exactly happened with that, why it happened, how it happened, that haven't been answered. And uh, my understanding is the NDAA does not tire, uh, tie, excuse me, the getting answers to the Pentagon, getting funding to, to rebuild this ship. And that would be a, a way to actually get them to answer. <laughs> 